Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day on um, a Friday to join us today. Um, I'm very excited to have you all here and talk to you all about um, this proposed set of standard implementation outcome measures for HIV interventions that we have been working on through ISCI. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dennis Lee. I'm an assistant professor at Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois. And today I'm joined by two colleagues, Caroline Ade, who is assistant professor in the Department of Health Policy at Vanderbilt, and Cherie Schwartz, who's an assistant scientist in epidemiology at Johns Hopkins. Um, we've been working on this for um, probably about the last 10 months or so, and so we're excited to share it with you. Uh, and this is also the first webinar in the um, Implementation Science Coordination Consultation and Collaboration Initiative for this funding year. And please let me know if you can see my slides. Just double checking. Yes. Awesome, thank you. So just uh, to go over what we're gonna be talking about today briefly, um, I will do a very short brief background on ISCI and how we came to be for those of you who may be new this year to, to the initiative. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the process for coordinating implementation outcomes or, or, or methods and getting to um, our final product. Uh, we'll walk through the specific or the, the tool itself uh, and give you a kind of a demonstration of what it looks like. And then um, my colleagues and I will be going through synthetic examples um, using uh, different HIV interventions and how we can use the crosswalk in our uh, in our day-to-day -day research. My hope is that uh, by the end of today's presentation, uh, or if you're listening to this online later, uh, that you'll be able to describe how different implementation outcomes may be critical at different stages of implementation research. And then uh, you'll also be able to use the HIV implementation outcomes tool, or what we call the crosswalk, to help identify and operationalize outcomes in current, HIV, uh, current EHE projects. So first, the three Cs in ISCI. Uh, as we all know um, pretty well, in 2019, uh, our current administration put forth the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative, um, also known as EHE, and it's been described as this once-in-a-generation opportunity to eliminate HIV infections in our nation. Um, so now that we have the right tools and the right data to curb the tide of the HIV epidemic, um, owing to decades of research and scientific breakthroughs, EHE really focuses entirely on implementation of these evidence-based interventions in order to uh, get to reduce uh, HIV infections by 90% by 2030. Um, and it's a, there's a coordinated effort across all of the agencies within the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, but for its role in the, in the national plan, the NIH funds implementation research to study how to best put these interventions into practice. So in year one of EHE, which began, um, um, I think early 2019 uh, or the end of 20, wait, is that right? Did I get my years right? Um, began last year. Um, the NIH funded 65 one-year planning projects in priority geographic areas across the country. Um, uh, these were the areas with the highest HIV incidence. I think most of us know that this. And then these pilot awards supported formative uh, research to prepare for more extensive implementation research that was to come. So within this context, um, uh, the NIH identified a, both a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, the challenge being that there, in, in domestically in the US, there are a number of lim a limited number of HIV researchers with um, implementation science expertise. And then uh, most of the 65 grantees from this first year were not these implementation science experts. In, in fact, most of them had had little to no implementation science training um, at all based on a survey that we did with them. So the opportunity, however, was that we have 65 kind of similar projects, all at the same uh, stage of research going on at the same time. So there's a lot that we could be learned about implementation across the country in different contexts and different uh, with different interventions. Um, so it's an opportunity for all of the projects to be greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, to maximize the value of implementation research in the EHE plan, then the NIH funded um, us to establish ISCI, or the Implementation Science Coordination Consultation and Collaboration Initiative. 
Uh, we call it ISKI because it is key, or implementation science is key to ending the HIV epidemic. Um, and our two overarching goals are to support high quality implementation science among the funded EAG projects um, by providing technical assistance and other educational experiences, and to create um, opportunities to develop generalizable knowledge from all of the 65, or originally 65 local knowledge um, locations um, through the coordination of methods and metrics. So in the past, uh, we've made a presentation about some of this um, consultation work um, towards the first goal in year one, uh, which I think will be available on the ISKI website, a community practice at, um, in the near future. But in this webinar, we'll be talking about this second goal of coordination, um, specifically outcomes or implementation outcomes. Uh, and these are just the core members of the ISKI team currently. Uh, we are expecting a few new team members to join on pretty soon. Uh, the whole initiative is co-directed by uh, Brian Mastansky and Nanette Bento. Uh, so first, let's talk a little bit about outcomes coordination and how knowing where you are going is the first step to getting there. Um, for a brief review, uh, implementation outcomes are separate or different from uh, efficacy or effectiveness outcomes in that they are the effects of deliberate and provocative actions to implement new treatments, practices, and services. So it's not about whether or not those the practices, treatments, and services work, but it's about how we get those into action or get those into practice. Um, Proctor um, further went on to define three functions of implementation outcomes. The first being as an indicator of implementation success. An example of that would be reach. So if you've reached a ton of people, um, you can consider that your implementation strategies were successful. Uh, a second function is that implementation outcomes are proximal indicators of implementation processes. Uh, and an example of that might be adoption. So if your you know, potential implementers have adopted the program, that, that is a marker of success, but you also haven't kind of made um, adoption in, in and of itself is not gonna make a lot of change in terms of clinical outcomes. And then finally, implementation outcomes are an intermediate outcome relative to service system and clinical outcomes. Um, and I'll talk about that in a tiny bit. Uh, many are probably familiar with um, one, if not or, or not if if not one, but or both of these uh, implementation outcome frameworks. Um, Russ Glasgow's re-aim model has been used for several decades now to conceptualize and quantify public health impact of various evidence-based interventions. And in uh, 2011, I believe. Um, Proctor and colleagues published a really seminal article detailing these eight implementation outcomes, um, acceptability through sustainability that you can see on the screen. Um, and moreover, they also showed how these implementation outcomes relate to outcomes further downstream. So the quality of service delivery, which you see in the service outcomes, and these are adapted from the IOM standards of care. And then further, you know, more distally from that, uh, the client or patient level health outcomes. So both of these frameworks are widely used in implementation evaluations today, uh, and they form the basis of, uh, of the tool that we will be presenting. Um, just a quick note that the, the two frameworks also map onto each other really well. Um, it's actually been really hard to find something in the literature that, that says this uh, directly, but um, luckily Russ Glasgow came and did a presentation last year at the ISKI Summit and um, he had this slide that was really handy uh, mapping the two together. And so you can see that there's a, a lot of overlap between um, on the left-hand side, Proctor's implementation outcomes and the re-aim um, domains on the right-hand side. So back to ISKI specifically, in year one, uh, given that we had 65 projects that were in the planning phase, uh, and most of the folks were coming from efficacy or effectiveness world, uh, it, it was it's not it was uh, unsurprising from the that the projects were mostly focused on uh, determinants, uh, understanding the context, the barriers and facilitators in their settings, and clinical and patient outcomes, um, trying to tie it back to um, how well does an intervention work. So it was we saw it as our job um, to help these projects think more broadly about different aspects of their implementation research, and that of course 
means focusing also on the right outcomes um, for designing the study that would come after the funding projects. So in providing technical assistance and education to the projects, we found that um, for some projects, especially those who were uh, newer to implementation research, um, they conceptually understood the implementation outcomes, um, but had some challenges operationalizing them specifically for their HIV projects. And so we turned to the literature for some guidance around how do we better operationalize implementation outcomes for HIV research and found that um, there's little, there are few resources out there that explicitly say, you know, this is how you should operationalize acceptability. And there's just very little in terms of uh, HIV examples in the literature. And so that's kind of what sparked the, um, a lot of this work uh, that we're presenting today, recognizing that there's a need for specific guidance um, as well as tangible examples uh, for projects or other researchers to work off of. Um, so I won't spend too much time on the methods of how we got to our final product or our final tool, but uh, I want to provide you enough information um, on how we uh, arrived at it. So the foundation, as I mentioned before, was using ReAIM and um, Proctor. We started with ReAIM as the base, um, in part because it's been used for a very long time and it does have a bit more structured and quantitative focus. Um, particularly, we, we turned to this one article that I highly recommend for anyone using ReAIM uh, called What Does It Mean to Employ the ReAIM Model um, by Kessler et al. in 2013. In it, they detail um, for folks, if you're using ReAIM, this is what we mean by it, and this is how you should measure things. Um, so that's where we started. And then um, we supplemented those with the Proctor outcomes, primarily acceptability, appropriateness, and feasibility. If we went back a couple slides and, and, and go back to the table of the two frameworks mapped on top of each other, you'll see those are the three that um, are either implicit in ReAIM but not specifically named, or um, they're not in ReAIM. So as an initial draft, uh, what we did was take all of the, the outcomes uh, listed in that uh, Kessler article and any additional ones from, from Proctor, and we operationalized it, um, each one for eight HIV interventions, um, kind of theoretically so. So we did PrEP, we did rapid art, molecular cluster response, or three of the ones that you can see on the screen here. Um, and we also did behavioral interventions, linkage interventions, um, and just to see, you know, what do we get once we apply um, kind of a theoretical construct measurement to uh, a, a real world HIV intervention. And what we quickly found was that most of the outcomes across all eight interventions look generally the same uh, and decided that it would be more efficient for us to consolidate it back into kind of a standard um, uh, a standard set of outcomes um, to be used across all HIV interventions with an additional column that had you know, special considerations or special instructions, depending on the type of intervention. Uh, this is generally the, the, the larger coordination process that we, uh, that we went through. Uh, first, again, we started with this um, uh, Kessler article to generate the outcomes. Um, we abstracted then from the eight interventions down to the standard approach that will work, we think will work for most HIV interventions. Um, these shared outcomes were, uh, well, we shared um, this initial draft with um, last year's EHE projects via small group meetings and got some of their feedback on their thoughts and how, how they might use it. Um, we presented our initial draft in two meetings to the CDC, to HRSA um, teams to, Kind of get their feedback as well and how it could be even more pragmatic for them to use. Um, our kind of long-term goal is to hope that we can coordinate across you know the program pro programmatic, programmatic things happening at CDC and HRSA um, that they use for process evaluations um, and, and coordinate that with the, the outcomes that are used in research so that you know we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, then our, our kind of next big tax, task was to hold an expert consultation. So we convened a panel of um, HIV implementation science experts um, and had a, a really thorough and nice discussion around these initial um, 
drafts of implementation outcomes. Uh, then we had them go through, um, uh, we consolidated that feedback and then had the expert panels go through a rating process, which I'll describe in a little bit more detail around the relevance or importance of each of these outcomes. Um, consolidated that feedback. And now we're um, decided that it's ready enough to be made available to the EHE projects, uh, which is why we're presenting it today. Uh, we would still like to review um, kind of our more final version with the NIH, CDC, and HRSA again to continue to adapt and develop it. Um, and we're also working uh, collaboratively with the, the panel on a publication of these outcomes. Um, here's a list of the panel members, uh, many of whom you probably will recognize uh, from across the country. And uh, one of the things that we heard over and over again from our feedback uh, early on was that uh, of the was the importance of considering implementation research stage. So as, as you all probably know, and as you will see in a bit, um, there are a lot of implementation outcomes, especially when you start operationalizing them. Um, but they are not all equally relevant at all stages of research. Um, and both REAIM and Proctor talk about this, um, this fact, but um, as, so, as far as we know, they, they never went so far as breaking it down by stage. And so we thought that would be very helpful um, to do. Um, and this kind of continuum of implementation research is adapted from uh, an article by J.D. Smith um, at all last year. Um, and we have, I think, seven from going from kind of the pre-implementation contextual research where you're looking at barriers and facilitators, selecting your strategies or adapting um, implementation strategies, pilot testing those strategies, um, taking or um, testing those strategies in an implementation trial uh, for, for strategy effectiveness. Um, kind of related to that is a comparative implementation trial where you're comparing two different strategies together. Uh, then there's taking it to scale, um, bringing it out to kind of a large uh, public health, to, for a large public health impact. And then of course, sustainability research. In terms of the ratings that we had our expert panel do, um, we had the, the panels separately rate um, the three stages, uh, rate each outcome on three stages of IR. So we chose pre-implementation, piloting, and trialing, which we had stuck together and taking to scale. Um, and we at ISKI made an initial kind of um, an initial rating of requirement recommendation. Um, and the panelists could agree with our rating or disagree and provide um, a different rating. The general takeaways from the panel ratings was that um, there is generally a fair amount of consensus across the, the, the um, experts that participated. Uh, for those that where some of the experts disagreed and provided comments, um, oftentimes those comments uh, were kind of situated in that gray area between two different stages. Originally, we had uh, conceptualized pilot testing a strategy and trialing a strategy as together, but th some of the comments um, kind of made us separate those out. Um, they're very similar, but they're the slight differences. I think were uh, we decided to to break those out. Um, and then um, another kind of lessons learned came uh, that came out was that framing um, the metrics in terms of the specific research questions that they're answering would be very useful and pragmatic for for people trying to use this uh, massive table of, of outcome measures. So now I just wanted to um, show you kind of the, the final product or the tool that we have um, developed so far. Um, and just as a warning, there's gonna be a lot of tables on screen. I know that's not the best presentation. Uh, it's not presentation uh, 101, but uh, there's a lot of detail to, to be shared. Uh, so I'll go through each of the uh, re-aim domains one at a time. Um, in REACH, uh, which we conceptualize as being primarily at the patient level, um, we have um, outcomes kind of in this third column over here that answer three main research questions. How many potential patients are were reached by the intervention? How representative are these patients? 
who were reached of the larger target population overall? And then how consistent is that reach across sites, across implementers and across strategies if you're comparing different strategies? Um, each of those are broken down into the specific um, operationalizations of that outcome measure. Uh, for example, um, here we denote for reach um, the number of potential patients in the target health system or community who are eligible for the intervention. And we call that one the public health denominator. Uh, if you're studying things like uh, taking to scale, you wanna know how many people is this actually gonna reach in the real world? Um, and what we're calling the study denominator is if the number of people who are eligible across the sites that you're targeting. So if you only pick a certain number of clinics, how many people in those clinics are eligible? Uh, and then for numerators, we have the number of people who are aware, the number of people who are offered an intervention, the number of people who initiated the intervention. Um, in our fourth column, we have general considerations around um, um, for, for, for specific um, constructs or specific measures. And then um, over on the right hand side, you'll see kind of the final uh, aggregate ratings from the experts um, for the three different uh, stages of implementation research. So the experts agreed that for, um, if, you're, if you're in the implementation preparation phase where you're kind of mostly looking at barriers and facilitators and probably looking, starting to look at what strategies to use, you're probably not going to be measuring reach in your um, study. But then if you, once you, get into piloting of your strategy, you'll start, um, start looking at reach and then of course bringing to scale. You'll want to look at things more in the public health realm. For efficacy and effectiveness, which is a, a domain within REAIM, um, you'll see that um, most people will be familiar with you know, answering effectiveness questions. But you'll see that um, across all three stages of research, um, we just rated, we just said that if it's relevant to your research question, if, if you're doing a hybrid trial, for example, where you are still measuring effectiveness, then you can consider um, adding in efficacy or effectiveness measures. Um, but we suspect that most people are coming into implementation science with training in eff effectiveness research already. Um, the one thing that we do recommend across all, um, all levels of study are um, acceptability and appropriateness of the implement of the intervention and the strategy itself at the level of the patient. Under adoption at the site level, you'll see that um, acceptability and appropriateness and then feasibility also pops up here as well um, of the intervention and the strategy pop up at the site level. Um, you'll see it again when, uh, when we talk about the in implementer level. Um, but these adoption um, level metrics answer the questions, how likely will sites want to adopt the intervention? How likely will they want to adopt the strategy? Um, essentially, how many, are, uh, how many did adopt the intervention? Uh, how quickly did they do so? And how representative are the, the adopting sites uh, versus those that um, uh, didn't adopt or those that are in the target health system or community? Dennis, can I ask a question? Yeah. This is Amy mm -hmm. from Brown University. Hey, Amy. Um, the, one of the challenges, and I'm new to this, I mean, my PhD is in operations research and global health, which is kind of like akin to this with just different nomenclature, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but when selecting these things for the proposals, um, you know, it's, it's easy to get overwhelmed with a million yourself, you know, with a million potential um, outcomes of interest, but also you can easily overwhelm a reader who will then just say, there's no way you can do all that, you know? And so then, uh, which is legit. Um, and then, you know, then I get into a, I just always go back to, you know, what matters in the real world rather than the frameworks and usually select those. But then when I've um, gotten feedback from you guys, very helpful feedback, um, in fact, <laughs> I'm often off the mark, you know, so 
then I think, well, which one of these things should I be focusing on A for grantsmanship, but, but B also just, so you're doing something that's actually relevant to the, for these, you know, I happen to work with health centers and pastors. Um, and you know, what's really important to them may not be, I'm, I'll stop there, but yeah. like just whittling it down to something that's plausible and makes sense for grants, but also when you present the science. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, thank you for that question. It's, it's yeah. a very important- I don't know if it's, it's not a very pointed question, but it's just from, from uh, as a trainee in this new discipline, that's like the, um, the evergreen question for me, which is like, which of these things should I be focusing on? Because all of them are relevant. I mean, I happen to work in the deep South where um, they haven't done any of this at any of the health centers that I work with. And, uh, and so then you're like, okay, this is tabula rasa. Um, where to start? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, there are a couple of things um, there that I could say. One is, uh, I think you, you, you hint at the, the really the importance of working with your community partners and implementing partners within implementation science. And they're going to, you know, if they are not on board or if they don't find what you're doing acceptable um, or appropriate, then the whole project is likely to fail. Um, so that's one thing to consider. And if they have specific metrics um, that they definitely want captured, um, that's definitely something that you should consider high or um, kind of, uh, as important or relevant to, to, to research. Um, a, a good example of that is when we talk to people at HRSA and CDC, they, um, you know, from a science standpoint, we're like, please stop focusing on efficacy, please stop focusing on effectiveness. Um, but for these programmatic folks, they're like, oh, well, we always want to see some efficacy or rather effectiveness um, outcomes. And so um, practically speaking, it's, uh, they want to have effectiveness outcomes in their, um, um, in the research. And so um, kind of the stakeholders dictate which ones to choose. Part, um, a lot of our work with trying to identify which ones are the most important by stage of research is uh, in part to help the, the users of this tool whittle down from, I think in total right now, there's 71 rows in this sheet. Um, but to whittle down to maybe the most important 20. Um, and um, and also in, in, in part helping the folks um, in grants focus on the most important, saying that I'm studying, you know, I'm at this stage of implementation research and these are the most important ones to focus on. Um, and then the third thing that we, that are, um, I can say is um, with trying to have conversations with HRSA and CDC, we want to uh, make these outcomes as pragmatic to them as well, and try to con make connect the dots with um, with um, those in the public health workforce, saying that oh yes, it would be really wonderful for us to be measuring reach as an outcome as well, because then that's a way for us to evaluate the um, to our programs. So if we can connect the implementation research world with kind of what's happening on the ground with implementation practice and share those outcomes. Um, I think there, there's a lot to be gained there. I hope that help, helps answer the question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so so here with adoption at the site level, you'll see there's a little bit um, a little bit more varied across the different stages of implementation research. Again, a lot less that is relevant if you're in implementation preparation, but once you get into piloting and bringing to scale, um, you'll see some variation in, you know, you can always measure something if it's desired to your, to your project. But um, as you get bigger and bigger with, with um, uh, your project, there are more and more things that are required. Um, for the sake of time, I won't go through adoption implementer level. Uh, there's mostly the same questions, just instead of at the kind of level of the site, your level of the, the people who are doing the implementation on the ground. Um, within the implementation domain, um, again, you'll see that if you're in implementation pre preparation, you're probably not 
putting something into practice just yet. So these outcomes may not be relevant to that, that stage of study. Um, but these, these constructs answer the questions of, you know, how quick are you putting something? Uh, how quickly are you in, um, implementing your intervention? How well are you implementing your intervention, meaning the fidelity, um, both the quality and quantity? Um, how well are you implementing the strategies that are that you're trying to test? If you're testing strategies, how how much does it cost? And then under maintenance, um, maintenance outcomes as defined by REAIM are uh, reflect a lot of what was already in reach, in effectiveness, in implementation, and just extended over a period of time. Um, and so you'll see a lot of kind of repeats of what was in those previous tables just over you know six months later 12 months later um, so by the numbers um kind of the current iteration of this crosswalk we have 71 rows i said of, of outcomes uh, many of which are related to each other or you can probably group them um, and there's here's the distribution of what we and the panelists this um, Kind of identified as should be required for the, this particular stage of the research, um, should be recommended, um, perhaps desired, yeah. um, and not applicable. And unsurprisingly, um, implementation preparation has the most not applicable. So uh, one other thing that really came out of our um, conversations with the panelists, with um, implementation practitioners, with the projects, from last year was that having examples is absolutely key. And so we um, wanted to, we, the panelists broke into groups and have been working on synthetic examples, maybe drawing from some of uh, individual's own research um, from our knowledge of the, the, the field. Um, so synthetic examples to illustrate how to use the crosswalk tool to select outcomes for a particular research question. And then, um, the one caveat I will say here is like, as, as Amy pointed out, there's a ton of outcomes to choose from. Um, and for the sake of time, each example, um, each example intervention uh, is just focusing on a selection of 10, um, but there's always more that can be, can be looked at. So with that, I'll first turn it over to, um, I believe this is Carolyn, right? Yeah, so you'll just control the slides. Awesome. Okay. So hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Um, so this is not based on my research, just in case anyone has like specific questions about it. It was more based on just a synthetic thing that we thought up. But we really wanted to start with um, how do you use sort of re-aim to capture data on a pilot test of a different strategy? Um, and our strategy, yeah, is looking at um, getting routine testing of people um, who have substance abuse disorder um, and are receiving MAT or other types of uh, support services in either in a health facility, in a community clinic or in the community. Um, why did we focus on this uh, population? They're relatively high risk for contracting HIV due to sharing of needles, syringes, um, risky sexual behaviors. Um, and so we thought this was like a really good population in order to try to improve uptake of HIV testing. Next slide. So there is um, some uh, evidence base that uh, this, this particular population should be tested about every six months when they are come into a health facility or receive any kind of service visits for either harm reduction strategies um, or any kind of counseling. Um, but it's difficult to do this because um, as anyone who knows who uh, does pre provide support for these individuals, if you have a 15 minute appointment, uh, there's 25 minutes or 30 minutes of things that you could probably talk to. It could be issues of vaccination. It could be issues of needing additional counseling, housing. There's a lot of other additional needs that this population has. And so um, trying to figure out a way that a strategy where we could get this regular HIV HIV testing during service visits where it didn't take up a ton of time for the healthcare provider um, was important to us. Next slide. Um, so, sorry, 
Sorry. So um, what we figured is that we would potentially want to have really a high yield. We would identify individuals during this MAT treatment. Um, uh, what our goal was to, um, when you go in for services, at least at Vanderbilt, um, what we have is that people have to go in, they go into a bathroom, they have to pee in a cup um, to do a urine drug screen in order to then continue receiving treatment. Um, our strategy was to provide a cheek swab um, in the same cabinet where they would uh, find their urine screening cup um, and have that person pee in a cup and also um, rub their cheek in order to do an HIV test at the same time. So that this would all be done before they see the provider and that the um, results would be provided at the same time um, as the urine screening was uh, provided to the healthcare provider. So in terms of um, heavy lift, it should be a pretty light lift from the provider's perspective, whether that be the nurse or the um, the physician. And um, it should be pretty easy also from the patient perspective. We're not drawing any blood. And so the acceptability should be pretty high. Next slide. So our, our questions that we wanted to look at in this pilot, because remember it's just a pilot, um, is are clients willing to perform the cheek swab with fidelity? So one, do they do it and do they do it properly or do they sort of half um, half but do it, where they sort of half do it, but they don't really do it, and they just sort of stick it in the cabinet. Um, did the staff actually add this task to their activities? Um, do we find undiagnosed HIV positive clients? Um, and does the benefit to the clients outweigh the cost to the system? So are we really finding the right people? Um, we have decided or we decided to do a pilot implementation in three settings um, using an interrupted time series design. Um, the three settings, like I said, hospital setting, community setting, and um, a clinic setting with a focus on acceptability, fidelity, and understanding the context in order to determine if we should then scale this up. Next slide. So reach, oh, you did change the slides. So the reach um, outcome that we wanted to look at as required is just to get a sense of how many people are tested versus how many people have come into the clinic. So are we actually reaching all of the people who should be reached every six months? So there would have to be something in Epic or whatever system that they were using to sort of tag someone to say, hey, this person is eligible to be tested because we haven't tested them in the last six months. Does the nurse get that information and do they put the cheek swab test in the cabinet for the patient to look at? So this would be at the level of the patient. Um, it would answer the question of how many potential patients were reached by rapid HIV testing. Um, and really the primary outcome here is does rapid uh, self-testing increase the coverage? So a lot of times people are sort of doing testing sometimes um, by sort of saying that we have this test that does every six months. Are we increasing the testing coverage in this population? Next slide. We also, however, think it's very important, particularly in a pilot phase, to determine are the characteristics of those who are tested different from those who are not. Um, so are we potentially not putting the cheek swab in the cabinet for a certain subset of the population? Um, and we have seen some of this with other tests where if somebody comes in, they seem to uh, be under the influence of uh, narcotics or other issues. Perhaps the nurse doesn't want to give them the test at that time because there's other issues that need to be addressed. Um, are some people just refusing the test and what types, what populations are those that are refusing the test? Again, this is at the level of the patients because that's how REACH is. It answers the question about how representative are the patients who complete a rapid test of the target population and are there systematic differences? Again, we would look through EPIC um, if we were at Vanderbilt for looking at those data. And obviously we would wanna see if there's a change in who is reached by rapid testing because some people were reached before. Once we implement rapid testing, are we getting a better spectrum of individuals who may be at risk of HIV? Next slide. So um, effectiveness is also important. Um, how we decided to look at this was the positivity rate. So how many positives are we finding based on how many people we're testing? So if we tested 10,000 people and only found four people who are positive, you know, that's a lot of money. It's, it's a significant amount of effort. Is that really worth doing it? So this is obviously at the level of the patients and we are, the, it answers the question, are we reaching those at high risk of HIV? Um, and other considerations is we want to see if once we find somebody who's HIV positive, 
does this, are we able to effectively link them to care? And are they taking, um, are they having a high rate of uptake of HIV treatment? So sort of some downstream effects as well. Next slide. So then we shift to adoption, um, which is very important, particularly in the pilot phase to make sure that the acceptability and appropriateness and feasibility of this intervention or this strategy for increasing testing is, uh, is possible in these three different facilities. This is more at the level of the providers. So it answers the question of, is this strategy acceptable, appropriate and feasible? Our first, um, as you can see, this is our first of a couple of adoption measures we're looking at. We would do surveys with the treatment team using adapted um, acceptability, uh, appropriateness and feasibility metrics um, using the Weiner scales. And then what we want to get a sense of is what aspects of the program could potentially cause challenges in clinical care. Next slide. And how we would get at those um, would be to do some qualitative interviews with the providers. So um, we would want to get a sense of, oh, I think I may have meshed a couple of things together, but we want to get a sense of how many people are agreeing to do this work. Sorry, the outcome of actually at the top is incorrect. Um, but we want to get a sense of what providers are actually um, putting this, you know, the, the cheek swab in, in, the, um, in the cabinet and who, who is not doing that. And then in terms of, so at the provider level, we would get a sense of who's having difficulty with actually, you know, putting this, the thing in, in, the, um, in the cabinet, who, who is doing it all the time, but also what are some of the challenges to providing the services? So do people see value in the program? Do they think of it as another pain in the butt thing that they have to do? Um, are some... <laughs> It's all good, Dennis. Um, so what are some of the sites that decide to participate? Like I imagine usually when you're doing a pilot, I think most people can say this, there's very few times when adoption is zero because most people when they're doing a pilot end up doing a pilot at a facility that they know um, that they have relationships. And so adoption of zero is relatively infrequent. Thank goodness. Um, so we want to get it. Of course, if the site doesn't do it, that's important. Um, but often we want to look at sort of one step down at the provider level to see who's not doing this and then get some information from a qualitative interviews as to why. Next slide. So then when we look at implementation, um, the outcome we would look at specifically is the fidelity across all implementers and computed at the site level. Um, this is obviously, again, at the provider and clinic level. So how closely is a strategy delivered as designed? Um, did they have stockouts? Um, are some people just not providing the, you know, the cheek swab? And we would look at an audit of patient testing records by provider to determine, um, you know, are some systems needing to be adapted to make the strategy work? Are there some um, with some patient groups or is there in some scenarios where this is really difficult maybe someone doesn't have to pee in a cup at certain visits. And so obviously forcing them then to go in to do the cheek swab is an additional step that they wouldn't normally do. And so are those patients not having to, are not actually getting the test. Next slide. And then the second thing, which is obviously very important when you have something costs money is looking at some costing. And we do think that this is very important at the level of the health facility. So how much is it going to cost to deliver the self-testing strategy? Um, we're gonna look obviously at staff salaries, hopefully those won't go up, but there are supplies that would um, cost money. So given that the self-test cost um, some additional expense. We're interested to see if adding the strategy would be cost effective at improving reach and individual outcomes. Next, uh, next slide. Maintenance is something that our group sort of struggled with because we don't really think um, that in a pilot that maintenance is really something that we should focus on. So we were sort of struggled with figuring out what we could do here. Um, we do think it's important to get a sense for um, in this case, because it costs money to buy these um, cheek swabs, how could this be funded in the long term? We would do interviews with providers, figure out um, how they feel about the program after it's been running for some six months, eight months, to get a sense of, is the program being integrated into the workflow? workflow? Is this being accepted to people after it's you know been up and running for a while? Do they have any intention of continuing to purchase the materials? Because if they don't, you know, obviously maintenance isn't really going to work, but um, with a pilot, if they're not willing to keep going with it because you don't have very, very good evidence at this point 
then it sort of makes sense that you would then sort of take this to scale up and find another strategy to cover the costs of these types of tests. So I don't think that we felt like this was um, a big issue, but um, for maintenance at a pilot level, we thought uh, qualitative interviews would be your best bet. And I think that's it from my side. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Uh, so I'm going to do the synthetic example number two, uh, representing uh, Lisa Hirschhorn, Larry Chang, and Michael Mugavero. Uh, who worked with me on this example. Um, and this will be for implementation trials uh, and the treat pillar. Uh, our intervention is going to be health department-based community health workers, or sorry, our, our strategy rather, is going to be health department-based community health workers um, used to improve early HIV treatment, uh, also known as rapid art or rapid start. Um, there are a lot of different rapid art protocols across the country. Um, here you can see kind of one protocol from uh, the New York Health Department. Uh, but in essence, they all involve some type of an assessment of psychosocial barriers to treatment and adherence. Um, there is some education on medication adherence. There is the actual provision of medicine um, rapidly. Uh, which is in the name, and then there's a follow-up that occurs soon afterwards. Um, so we uh, chose to do health department community health workers uh, because um, in existing rapid art programs, there um, the, we know that medical teams can effectively provide met rapid art if and when patients present themselves for treatment. Um, but there's some variability in this length of time between the a, a patient or client's first diagnosis and presentation to treatment uh, because a lot of HIV testing doesn't occur in clinics that deliver um, medications. And so it, there's a lot of variability that depends on the linkage capacity of those testing sites. Uh, so we uh, thought that would be perhaps a centralized strategy for community-based linkage um, and outreach could be, or uh, could be, that bridging strategy that will more quickly link um, individuals di newly diagnosed in the community to um, appropriate clinics for them. Um, and then it could also, over time, given that these are folks also from community, uh, it could also help improve long-term adherence uh, by better addressing psychosocial barriers. So the implementation strategy uh, operationalized out is really to have paid or su and supervised community health workers based at the public health department, not just scattered at individual CBOs, but at the public health department that act as a central bridge across community-based uh, organizations and testing sites and clinics. So there's always someone to, if, if your organization um, tests but doesn't have linkage workers itself, it, there's always someone to go to. The research questions for this type of strategy that we had would be, um, does the use of these health department community health workers improve the reach and delivery of rapid art? Does the addition of these community health workers improve the effectiveness of rapid art to achieve viral suppression? Uh, that's the long-term adherence piece. And does the benefit of including H, uh, community health workers outweigh the costs? Um, similar to what Carolyn was saying, if it costs money, we need to make sure that it, that it actually saves costs in the long term. So the hypothetical study design and setting that we propose is a type three effectiveness implementation hybrid trial. Um, where we are comparing this community health worker, the centralized community health worker model to regular systems of care. Um, our unit of analysis and randomization is going to be jurisdictions or public health authorities that are already implementing rapid art. Um, so we don't have to go through the process of, um, uh, of implementing rapid art by, um, by itself and they can solely focus on the testing of the strategy. Uh, we're proposing a cluster randomization with stratification to match, you know, um, jurisdictions with similar characteristics together, and then do a within in between design. So compare each jurisdiction with, you know, how well they were doing in terms of um, rapid art delivery before versus after the community health worker um, strategy was implemented, and then across jurisdictions, those with the community health worker strategy, those without the community health worker strategy. So for REACH, uh, we thought that an important required outcome is that um, the number of new diagnoses offered rapid art within X number of days, and we wanted to leave that variable to the, the programs that are already in place in those different jurisdictions uh, out of those who were eligible for rapid art, and the number of new diagnoses who actually initiated rapid art out of those who were eligible. 
um, this is at the level of the patient um, and answers the question of how many potential pa patients were, uh, were reached by rapid art and is the primary outcome of our research, our proposed research study. Um, and we proposed using data sources like the health department EpiData uh, and then C individual CBO testing records to get at the numerators and the denominators. Um, another reach outcome that we are cons that we propose is to look at the characteristics of those patients that are receiving rapid art versus those that do not. I think Carolyn did a really good job of explaining why we are interested in seeing those who are reached and those who are, are not. So I won't dive too much into this, but um, it really gets at how representative is the is the population that you're reaching. For effectiveness, um, we wanted to measure the differential effects of rapid art by different patient characteristics, including who received the community health worker strategy and who did not. Um, this not only answers the question about how consistently our intervention affects across um, different patient populations, but also uh, we're really interested in seeing if the strategy itself changes intervention effects uh, of rapid art, basically on long-term adherence and, and viral suppression um, in some type of moderation effect. Um, and that is also at the, the patient level. And we would get most of um, that data from clinical records. Uh, for adoption, um, as I mentioned before, acceptability, appropriateness, and feasibility is important. Um, we wanted to, at the health department level, uh, see how likely they were to adopt the strategy um, or how likely jurisdictions like them would be to adopt the strategy outside, the, outside of a trial. Uh, do and we wanted to survey health department existing health department HIV teams, so the director of HIV services, existing DIS staff, um, disease intervention specialist staff, other people who work on HIV within health departments to see if you know adding someone new to their team would be acceptable. Um, uh, what we didn't think was necessary was looking at acceptability, appropriateness, and feasibility of the clinical intervention itself, the, the rapid art, uh, because um, those jurisdictions would already be doing that. For another adoption level um, measure, we wanted to see if the number of uh, health departments that agreed to work with the community health workers, um, how, many of, how many agree to work with the community health workers out of the number approached to work with this community health worker strategy. Uh, and again, it, um, it answers the question of how many people would likely you know, adopt it in the future. Um, and we would get those data from study records of, of who, which health departments have been approached and what their response was. And the reason for this is as, as we move towards trialing and then further down uh, with the goal of getting to scale, um, you want to um, you want to understand you know, who is going to adopt this in the real world. Um, we the, I think the difference is that in a trial, um, you're using the study denominator rather than the public health denominator that I discussed earlier. Another adoption level metric um, was to focus on if for those health departments that were if they were not approached, why were they not approached? Uh, and are there systematic reasons for excluding certain types of health departments or jurisdictions from, from this trial? Again, getting at you know, what is the external validity of, of the trial? Um, and uh, this move towards generalizability. The fourth level adoption characteristic or adoption metric would be um, characteristics of the different testing organizations and clinics who agree to use the health department-based community health worker in their linkage programs versus those that do not. You know, do some of them have their own community health workers? Um, do the, some of them just not want to use that um, service that's provided? And this will again get um, answer the question around representativeness um, and uh, give us information about generalizability of uh, the implementation strategy. And we would, get at this information by doing study specific surveys with um, the implementers, uh, meaning people at the testing organizations and clinics themselves. For implementation, um, we thought that completeness, meaning fidelity, um, 
or sorry, we thought that um, fidelity would be a, a required outcome uh, that would be measured in terms of completeness uh, as well as quality of delivery. So how closely is um, our CHWs based at the health department delivering kind of linkage services to um, rapid art um, according to a protocol and then um, having an external audit of, of records of those interactions uh, looking at patient records to, to see, you know, maybe they did all of the steps on a checklist, but perhaps the, the, the quality of the interactions could have been improved. Uh, and we thought that for a complex strategy that involves a lot of human interaction, uh, like this, um, like community health worker based linkage, uh, it's important to think about fidelity in a number of different ways to really triangulate um, where any issues may be. Is it that not everything is getting done, which is more of a quantitative issue, or is it that things are getting done, but it's not getting done well, that's more of a qualitative issue. Um, I'm gonna move through this one pretty quickly, but again, with uh, putting in a new strategy that might cost money, it's important to look at how much money that's gonna cost. Uh, and then for maintenance, um, again, like I said before, maintenance, within the re-aim framework is a lot of the previous measures just reflected over time. So keeping up with uh, fidelity monitoring over a sustained period of time, um, does fidelity in terms of quality and quantity change um, as these strategies get implemented over six months, over a year? Um, and then with this particular consideration is if the strategy is con continued, it would be really ideal to, to integrate this fidelity monitoring into program or routine programmatic evaluation activities at the health departments. I think that's the end of my example. Thanks, Dennis. Um, so I'll be talking about our group's example uh, from the, the taking the scale uh, stage of, of research. And so here we're focused on, on preventing and I'm presenting, uh, this is also very much a synthetic example uh, on behalf of my group, which is uh, comprised of Patrick Sullivan, uh, J.D. Smith, and, and Sari Golub. I'm just realizing now that I can't advance the slides, so. Or can I? I can't, right? I don't have no, permission just, to do just, that. Just let me, um, okay. you can just tell me when to okay. Thanks. So, so this will be looking at scaling a 12-month um, PrEP navigation intervention to all sexual health clinics in, in New York State. So we know that PrEP, when uh, both delivered and actually taken, reduces sexual risk for HIV infection by up to 99%. And CDC recommends PrEP uh, for both men and women under certain conditions related to um, sharing of in injection, uh, injection drugs, uh, needles, uh, having condomless anal or vaginal sex and or uh, having a bacterial STI in, in the past six months. And they provide uh, at cdc.gov a nice uh, diagram of kind of how they envision, um, you know, the, the screening initiation and, and follow up for, for PrEP. Next slide. And so uh, in terms of the evidence-based clinical intervention that we're looking at here, I listed two, we're really gonna be focusing on PrEP navigation, but I just wanted to mention in terms of just thinking about this as a learning process that our team spent a little bit of time talking about, well, what is the evidence-based intervention? Because you could think of it as PrEP, of course. Um, PrEP is an evidence-based intervention, but we went a step down and really focused this example on PrEP navigation, um, which uh, you know is, is another level under PrEP. Um, and when we're thinking about the implementation gaps, we were you know discussing that, you know. PrEP is not reaching um, all PrEP eligible individuals. We know, we know that, there, that there are gaps in terms of who is being reached with PrEP. And part that is um, an issue in terms of provider uh, training and, and many providers have not been trained in terms of how to provide PrEP, but also we know that there's bias in assessment of risk. So who gets screened or who is perceived to be at risk can limit PrEP delivery, right? There's some individuals that uh, the provider might uh, determine are high risk and, and they may be right, but there's also many individuals that they may determine uh, based on their own um, you know, preconceived biases uh, or lack of uh, probing that an individual may be at low risk when in fact they may be at high risk and um, a good candidate for PrEP. 
and, and making sure that the screening is happening in that linkage to providers. So these are some of the implementation gaps that we are considering with the PrEP um, navigation intervention. Next slide. And so the implementation strategies um, that are comprised in this PrEP navigation uh, in the scale up uh, project are training for PrEP providers to prescribe and manage PrEP, training for PrEP navigators to screen for eligibility um, and educate clients on PrEP benefits, um, ensuring that the screening is uh, universal for PrEP at the facility level amongst the sexual um, and reproductive health clients. And so like this idea that when you come in and you check in, there's some automated questions that are being asked and that based on those questions um, that every, every client coming in the door should be answering, then you would be uh, linked to a, a prep navigator for some uh, slightly more detailed screening. And then if eligible, uh, linked to um, the provider. So that nav navigator is helping um, to link uh, link the patient to the provider for uh, potential prescribing of PrEP. Next slide. Yes. So the research questions that we wanted to answer, and again, thinking about this being at the stage of scale, scale um, to what extent can PrEP navigation be successfully scaled up across sexual and reproductive health clinics in New York? And here we're really focusing on the state of New York because um, we initially had talked about New York City and, and, and was that really broad enough for um, you know, for a project that's bringing something to scale. What is the impact and sustainment of these efforts? And what factors are associated with more rapid and complete implementation of the PrEP navigation intervention? So our hypothetical study design and setting um, is a, is a follow-on to a successful um, RCT in a small number of clinics, um, which demonstrated effectiveness uh, of the PrEP navigation intervention um, in which developed an implementation plan. So we're building a, 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 on that existing evidence base and now trying to bring it to scale um, by offering all sexual health clinics in New York State the support um, through the Department of Health uh, to scale up PrEP navigation, you know, including um, trainings for that and access to um, budget for uh, PrEP navigators. Focus and the, um, the focus is, uh, for this is on understanding the context of adoption implementation. So I think this is really the case throughout, as Dennis said at the very beginning of this talk, but I think particularly when we're thinking about scale, we've really focused a lot more at the facility level um, and to some degree the provider level than, than the patient level, since we're thinking about how to implement at scale. Next slide. So in terms of the first uh, reach outcome, um, and you know, despite what I just said, we do of course have some patient level or client level when you're thinking of PrEP outcomes that we considered as well. So um, you know, the people that were the PrEP clients uh, engaged uh, or, or potential patients engaged by the navigator um, divided by over the total PrEP eligible uh, population in New York. So that's when we're thinking about reach, how many were engaged by the navigator over how many uh, were potentially eligible. And so this is at the patient level, but it's trying to answer this question of how well did the program reach eligible individuals? Um, and so here our data sources were electronic medical records, but also public health surveillance data. And the, you know, some of the considerations are, you know, that we need an accurate understanding of the estimated number of PrEP eligible um, individuals in New York. Next slide. And then our second reach outcome was looking at those who were engaged um, by the navigator um, over those who were uh, PrEP eligible uh, per clinic. So really trying to think that, you know, within those sites that are uh, implementing um, the, the intervention, to what extent is the navigator actually reaching the, the patients when they are PrEP eligible? So again, this is at the patient level, uh, but answering uh, the question within the adopting, adopting sites, how many potential patients are reached? And here we would be using the EMR data um, based on that initial screening when, um, when the patients come in. And some of the considerations are that we're interested in exploring the heterogeneity by clinics, um, as well as factors. So did, um, you know, what is the reach, what are the differences in reach based on geography or the patient population size? gender or race or age composition of um, the, the clinic attendees, 
and are those associated with higher or lower reach? Next slide. So now moving on to, to effectiveness. And um, here, you know, the outcomes that we're, that we're focusing on are the, the PrEP eligible um, individuals, patients um, started on PrEP um, over those who are PrEP eligible. Uh, we also were interested in those, uh, whether those uh, PrEP clients were retained on PrEP at six months. Um, given those that were, were started, and looking at um, new HIV infections. So really, we haven't focused so much on the clinical effectiveness. It really was, for us, probably the, um, the shortest part of our conversation, um, because we're really re relying on the previous trial results for our effectiveness. But, if, but we um, did think it was worth um, considering these. And, and for us, this was a, a recommended outcome. So again, we're at the patient level. Um, but we're trying to understand uh, how well the intervention worked, not just in terms of the implementation, but then the next step in terms of the patient outcomes. And for this, our data sources were um, EMR, but also surveillance uh, data in, in terms of understanding new infections within the state. Um, and so when we were thinking about, you know, things that considerations, you know, uh, we're interested in what these outcomes looked, again, um, overall, but also um, by clinic. Next slide. So adoption for us was one of the really important outcomes, and I'm only presenting uh, a couple of them here, but I think this is what uh, dominated uh, a lot of um, the things that we were considering in terms of uh, bringing an intervention to scale. So uh, the first outcome that, that we'll highlight here, the number of sites providing navigation, um, given the number of um, eligible sites in New York. So, you know, really answering this question of what is the adoption rate of PrEP of the PrEP navigation intervention amongst the sexual and reproductive health clinics. So if all are eligible uh, to provide this intervention, uh, to what extent are they actually taking it up? So now we're at the, the site, or the, in this case, the clinic level. And the data uh, sources um, would be uh, PrEP service inventories um, as well as clinic surveys. So um, surveying all of the clinics in the state to understand uh, which of them are taking up this intervention. And in terms of the considerations, thinking about how representative are the adopting sites amongst all of the um, eligible sexual and reproductive health clinics. So again, um, these comparisons of, of who is and who is not adopting, but um, you know, at, at the clinic level in terms of urban versus rural, racial composition of the clinic, sex, um, you know, sex gender composition of the clinic, and, and some of the provider characteristics. So here we also spent some time thinking about equity in our conversation in terms of who is and isn't being reached. Um, in terms of the adoption of the intervention. Um, and, and I, you know, it's interesting I just said the word reach because I think this links back to the question that Karen had in the chat earlier. And so, again, you know, because we're thinking about at the, at the facility level who is adopting it, um, you know, that's, I think, related to the reach question earlier, but because we're talking about the, at the facility level or at the provider level, um, those we were considering in the adoption outcome rather than in the reach outcome. And, and hopefully um, that is, is making a little bit more sense now, but I think we can also have a discussion about that afterwards if not. Um, so the second, the second um, set of uh, adoption outcomes that, that we're presenting here are related to the providers. So the, the number of um, PrEP providers um, newly initiating PrEP across sites, um, as well as those that are um, currently um, prescribing PrEP. So maybe there were some that were prescribing PrEP um, before already, before this intervention was introduced and the training offered. And so here again, really thinking at the, the now at the implementer level, at their provider, so how many potential implementers um, were adopting the intervention um, and using the EMR prescribing records, as well as the clinic surveys to understand this. Um, and then the considerations were um, also assessing um, how many uh, of these uh, PrEP providers are, are prescribing PrEP, um, given those that potentially could be prescribing PrEP. And I think one thing to just really notice um, or highlight is that for us, we didn't really focus at all on the acceptability, appropriateness, and the feasibility um, of the PrEP navigation intervention because we're at the stage of scale. So those were outcomes that we did have some recommended outcomes that we um, did consider in our, our larger exercise, but really when we were highlighting those that were of important, those weren't the, um, the types of outcomes that we were really um, focused on. And again, I think one other thing to just note is that we were here focusing on the PrEP providers, 
um, the prescribers rather than the navigators because um, in the way that this intervention is, is envisioned, the, the prep navigator, their entire job um, is to be providing um, this navigation, whereas we understand the prep providers, they may receive training to pre prescribe prep, but they still may have uh, less even uh, prescription patterns since they have a whole host of other things in their um, job description. Next slide. And so in terms of implementation, um, we were interested in the number of universal screens completed uh, by site, um, given the number of, of patient visits. So making sure that this is actually happening as, as planned. Um, and really, again, this is getting at the completeness of the strategies being delivered. So here using the EMR records. Um, and again, considering heterogeneity in performance across the clinics, you know, trying to understand that there are differences. Um, why do they exist in terms of there any um, obvious ways of understanding uh, which clinics are performing um, uh, better or, or worse? Um, and then a follow, follow up on the number of uh, patients that were uh, PrEP eligible and, and navigated to a PrEP provider um, would be an additional outcome. Next slide. And then we're also interested um, or thought important to highlight the, the number of providers trained at the adopting sites over the number of potential eligible providers at the adopting sites. So again, now we're thinking at the implementer level um, and really, again, this is thinking about the completeness of the strategies delivered. So um, training was one of the uh, implementation strategies. So looking at to what extent that is um, was taken up. And again, using these clinic surveys, indicating the number of providers on site and the number that have received training. Um, and then another outcome that, that we did not highlight here, but I think is related to this and, and that uh, was a consideration is just really also considering the speed of the time to implementation of the intervention. Next slide. So in closing, uh, we have a couple of maintenance outcomes that, um, that also could be highlighted. I should note that you know, we, didn't, we didn't highlight in these slides, um, I didn't put any of the, the, the budget impact analysis in terms of cost, but you know, obviously when you're thinking about scale, cost is an important outcome and that would be something that you also would uh, likely wanna be considering. We get into that a little bit here in our maintenance um, piece, but, but certainly measuring the, the costs uh, would be important as an implementation outcome as well. So in, in terms of um, maintenance, the, the outcome that we we're looking at is the percentage of um, PrEP providers that received the initial PrEP training um, at, at 12 months and then at, at 24 months. So, you know, we understand that there may be things like um, staff turnover. And so if a training is offered one time and then staff um, turnover, you may see that the sustained impact of that, um, that intervention is not playing out. And so you're going to need to be repeating this, this training over time if you plan on sustaining the, the impact. Um, Again, so thinking about this at the, the implementer level, and this is answering, you know, the question is, is delivery of the intervention strategies being sustained at acceptable levels over time? And here again, using these an annual clinic surveys. Next slide. And then finally, looking at the, the, the proportion of the PrEP navigators that re are retained at, at 12 months. So envisioning this as a 12 month um, intervention for which there's some initial funding and then, you know, the Department of Health determining uh, alongside the clinics to what extent it is a priority to, to maintain this intervention. And so um, is the delivery of the intervention sustained over time? Um, but looking really at, you know, the, the turnover of, um, of navigators, both within that, that initial year, but then are, are they being sustained? Um, our budgets being at a, at a site level, our budgets being reformulated in that second year to include the provision of prep, prep navigators um, as a signal of the potential sustainability and maintenance of this intervention over time. So I think that is it. Thank you. So just have, I have, thank you so much, Sheree and Carolyn for, for sharing the examples. Uh, I just have a very few concluding thoughts to share with the folks before we open it up to questions. Uh, first is that this, uh, we, we envision this being, um, you know, we, we say close to finalized, but we envision it being a living document given that we still would like to review it with the implementation practitioners who are on the ground to see, you know, how can we continue to evolve this into something that's more useful for, for everyone, both researchers and uh, um, implementers. And, um, you know, as 
the projects go out and put it to use, there you know, are things that are likely to come up. Uh, we want to continue to refine the examples, refine, um, refine the, the, the outcomes themselves. Um, for uh, those who are interested in using the Crosswalk tool um, in the near future, um, it should be going up on the ISCI Community Practice website um, kind of within the, new, the next week or so, I think. Um, uh, for the current EHE and, and previously funded EHE projects to use. Um, following publication of the paper, I think we want to make that publicly available to everyone. Um, and then the IS hubs um, can also use uh, the crosswalk tool to work with currently funded projects um, in um, selecting the outcomes for, the, for their research. And with that, um, if you have any questions, feel free to email iski at northwestern.edu, um, go to the ISKI Community of Practice, uh, where we do have both public facing and some more limited resources uh, available. Um, if you would like to contact me directly, uh, my email addresses and Twitter are, are on the screen. Um, and with that, I, that's the end of the presentation. We wanna open it up to questions um, that anyone might have or discussion. Um, so this is Karen. Hi, thank you so much for those presentations. Um, I do think that they were super illuminating and um, helped me tease some things out. Um, in terms of what I put into the chat box, I was really thinking about um, the project that we've had going on over this past year, which is um, about uh, stigma reduction interventions. And those with the best evidence are at the organizational level. So we'd wanna measure um, reach in terms of who in the organization is trained in the intervention. But looking at the crosswalk, I'm thinking now maybe you thought of this as penetration instead, because um, you've got that pegged to the organizational or policy level. Um, and you do say that it is um, connected to reach. But I'm just curious, is the individual level always the client? <laughs> Sorry, did, did that make, question make sense? Yeah, um, I think I got most of it. Yeah, um, this is me actively trying to translate what I've just absorbed, so it's raw. <laughs> um, so if I could repeat the question back to you to make sure that I understood it. Um, you, if you have strategies focusing on um, providers, is that not the in individual level? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess it depends on how one conceptualizes it, but if the providers are looked at as individuals, would you then not be wanting to look at reach as opposed to um, if it's at the organizational level, then you're really framing it as penetration instead, or at least yeah. that's what I took from the crosswalk. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, and I would love to hear Carolyn's and Sheree's thoughts on this too. Um, the way that we conceptualized it is that to define that everything that's under the reach domain is at the um, patient or client level um, because those are whom you're trying to reach with your clinical intervention. Um, and reach to providers, reach to sites would be would fall under the domain of adoption um, or as you said, penetration, although we didn't use that specific wording. Um, so um, like the number of providers who you who go through a training out of the number of uh, providers who could have possibly gone to that training, uh, we have under uh, adoption at the provider level. That said, um, sometimes it gets tricky, particularly in HIV, where we have a lot of interventions that beget other interventions that beget other interventions. And so defining what you call your clinical intervention or the thing that you're trying to implement. Um, and then the strategy to support that is, is very key. So if you're, if you move just a slightly upstream and let's say you kind of, um, a good example of this is um, the prep navigation, right? Prep, prep navigation supports the implementation of prep. But if your focus on the research question is on the prep navigation, you might be looking at other strategies to support prep navigation and not be, be less focused about prep. Uh, 
Um, and I wonder, I mean, I think maybe the other, the, just like one thing to add to that in terms of like, I think taking a step back, perhaps maybe it's useful to think about the mechanism of the proposed effect. So like, if you're thinking about, um, okay, so we're focused on stigma reduction amongst providers, but why? What is the sort of mechanism that, you know, and, and my guess is that it's because that is expected to translate into um, better provision of care and better outcomes at the patient level. And if that's the case, then, then I think it's easy to sort of maybe make that link in, in terms of the patient level being the reach and the uh, provider level being the adoption um, of some of the, you know, the evidence-based um, stigma reduction practices um, or some of the, you know, the strategies around the training and sensitization. But, you know, if, if that wasn't, if the end goal was not actually to improve patient care, then you might be thinking about that a little bit differently. But my guess is that is the sort of proposed mechanism of action. That may or may not be helpful. But. Any other final thoughts from um, Cherie, Carolyn? folks in the still on. I know it's Friday and it's near the end. All right, well, if not, then um, I, Cherie, Carolyn, I really wanna thank you again um, for, for taking your time and um, sharing your examples and your, uh, your time during this presentation. Um, thanks to those who uh, were on the call before, are still on the call, will maybe be listening to this webinar later on in time. Uh, and I wish you all a happy Halloween. <laughs>